Another massive economic intervention from the government as the furlough scheme is extended into October. Employers will have to pick up some of the costs from the summer, but it is still another huge blank cheque from the Chancellor. We will ask employers to start sharing with the government the cost of paying people's salaries. So how much could it cost? How will we pay for it? And will it be enough to keep most businesses afloat? Also on News at 10 tonight. They've had a horrendous time already, but now some care homes are on the brink of going bust as well. All of that could be for nothing, and it all gets taken away. And that's hard. Really hard. Open house again. The housing market is officially unfrozen with immediate effect, with viewing sales and moves permitted. 11 weeks and counting, and shot on sight if you break the rules. Manila, scene of the toughest lockdown in the world. I will not hesitate to order the police to arrest and detain you. Shoot them dead. And daily tests and possibly masks at training, the plan to get the Premier League back into action. This is On TV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. A staggering seven and a half million people have come to rely on the government's furloughing scheme, which has stepped in to pay our wages when our employers can't. It's been a job, if not a life saver, but it is hugely expensive and many people were understandably nervous it might be phased out quickly as the lockdown was eased, perhaps before companies had really had a chance to get back on their feet. So there was huge relief today at the news that Chancellor Rishi Sunak would allow companies to furlough their employees right up till the end of October. There was a catch from August. Employers will be expected to share the cost, though quite how much of it has yet to be spelt out. Uh, the idea is obviously to try to ease people back into the workplace and, of course, to cut the cost. It is another huge intervention, certainly, but will it be enough to keep us all in our jobs? Pubs are at the sharp end of the recession. This is one of four owned by a group in London. It's been closed for seven weeks. The beer has long gone off, but no one has lost their job. 68 staff are at home being paid by the taxpayer. We were looking down the barrel again of 10 days left of pay in the accounts. And we said, if all the money goes, we will pay it all to the staff and then the business will fold. The furlough saved the staff's jobs and it saved our business. A week ago, the Chancellor warned the job retention scheme will need to be phased out, but for now, it's been expanded. I'm extending this scheme because I won't give up on the people who rely on it. Our message today is simple. We stood behind Britain's workers and businesses as we came into this crisis, and we will stand behind them as we come through the other side. Seven and a half million people and counting have been furloughed in the job retention scheme. 80% of their wages are being paid by the government with a cap of £2,500 a month. The Chancellor has extended the scheme until October, but from August it will change. Companies will be allowed to bring furloughed workers back part-time. They will also be expected to start contributing to the cost of the scheme, although the level has yet to be set. Business groups had warned the Treasury of mass redundancies if the job retention scheme wasn't extended. It has been, but the Chancellor now expects businesses to start sharing the cost. And the danger here is that some companies will lay off staff as soon as they're required to start paying for them again. As it stands, furloughed staff aren't allowed to work. Kieran Mansfield is using his time to volunteer, making meals for the homeless. But the changes to the job retention scheme mean that from August, he'll be able to return to work part-time if there's work to go back to and have his salary topped up by the government. I'm keeping busy with this. And I think for a lot of people, a lot of my colleagues, it's uh, we all want to keep busy. You know, we're not nobody's looking to sort of get the furlough pay and sit at home and do nothing. The extra support the government is offering has been widely welcomed, but goodness, it comes at a price. There will be many tens of billions of pounds, certainly more than 60 billion pounds and probably more than 80 billion pounds. Now, 
Those are huge numbers. That's as much per month as we spend on the National Health Service. The job retention scheme is being tweaked to encourage companies to start reopening. Today, Ryanair announced plans to do just that. But while the airline has furloughed some of its staff, it's still letting several thousand go. And Joel uh, joins me now. Joel, listen, you, you spend a lot of your time talking to companies. What's your sense? Is this enough? Well, look, the scheme has been successful in the sense it was designed to incentivise companies to hold on to their staff as we head into what is self-evidently a very severe recession. And, look, uh, unemployment has risen sharply, but not anything like as sharply as it would have done had this scheme not existed. You know, we've got about a third of the economy, Tom, has been in a state of enforced uh, sedation. The question is, how quickly can they and how effective will this scheme uh, be as the economy starts to come out of it? Now, it has been extended and it, at huge expense, but the cost of the taxpayer of the government doing nothing would have been extraordinary and arguably far, far higher. The tweaks, the changes that the Chancellor have made today are very important. They make the scheme more flexible and they're designed to send out the message to companies to start thinking about that process of reopening. From August, they'll be able to take staff back part-time. That's extremely important. It gives a flexibility and smooths the passage back to work, in theory. But they are asking also companies to make a contribution to the cost of the scheme and it's not clear that they'll be in a position to. If you look at the sectors of the economy you can see uh, that uh, some are far more dependent on this scheme uh, than others around uh, accommodation and food, uh, far more dependent than construction and manufacturing. Now many pubs, hotels, uh, restaurants may not be open come August. If they are they may still be struggling and may not be able to service these payments. What would the Chancellor do in that sort of situation? The ability to withdraw this scheme will depend on the passage of the pandemic, it will depend on the rate at which which restrictions lift, and very importantly, the degree to which demand bounces back. Seven million people are on this scheme, Tom. Not all of them will have a job to go back to. OK, Joel, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's just um, uh, put all of that and more to, to Robert, who joins us from North London. Um, Robert, the last time we had government interventions on this scale, we were paying through it for it through austerity for a decade. What do you think will be the cost of all this? Well, there is an amazing paradox here, isn't there? The Tory party, when campaigning in 2010, said that the deficit run up by the then Labour government was unsustainable. And as you say, we then had, you know, seven, eight, nine years of cuts, austerity. We have a current prime minister who won't even use the word austerity. When I asked him comparatively recently whether austerity would follow, uh, I think he referred to it as the A word and he said he hated it. Uh, this is not a prime minister who wants to make cuts. So the question is, well, what is going to happen to all this debt? I think it's just going to sit there. Uh, and when you've got an independent central bank, as we do in the shape of the Bank of England, the government can, you know, for a period at least, more or less borrow as much as it likes. The Bank of England buys the debt. That's what's going on uh, at the moment. It's creating new money. Now, what this is not without any kind of economic impact. The last time this happened, we had deliberately massive rise in asset prices, not conventional inflation, but things like houses went up in value. That did make poorer those people, particularly younger people, uh, who weren't on the housing ladder, and it widened the gap between the haves, mostly older people with property, and have not. So there is likely to be a significant cost to this, but do I think there is going to be you know, a, a, a massive retrenchment when this is all over? No, quite the contrary. Well, you covered every dot and comma of the last bailout. How briefly do they compare? Mm. Uh, this is on a, an altogether different scale. You know, in my own mind, I am comparing this to the impact of the Second World War. Massive state intervention ushered in a Labour government that completely changed the relationship between government and private sector, massively increasing the role of the state. And I would imagine, I expect, we are going to see something similar this time. The private sector shrunk, the state becoming more and more important. OK, Robert, thank you very much indeed.
There was another deeply distressing glimpse today into what has been happening behind the closed doors of our care homes. The weekly update shows in the last week of April they made up 40% of all the deaths in England and Wales. The actual figure, 2,423, from the Office for National Statistics, was slightly lower than the week before, but the cost in life is still huge and the cost of coping with the virus is crippling too. We found one care home which has already announced it will have to close temporarily and others are likely to go the same way with all that means for residents and staff. There is enough happiness to fill this home and yet parts of Wren Hall now lie empty. Covid-19 cleared these rooms. A quarter of the residents have died. We've got goggles, we've got gloves. The virus hasn't just emptied beds, but the bank balance too. £13,000 on PPE alone. It's just a crippling cost. With another 60000 lost every month due to vacancies, in eight weeks this family firm may have to close. Your goal is to provide the best care possible and... It's all right, Anita. I know, it's been a rough few weeks. The thought that all of that could be for nothing and it all gets taken away. And that's hard. Really hard. But it isn't something she's going through alone. Tonight, ITV News believes this to be the first care home to close due to the pandemic. Friary Lodge in North London hopes to reopen, but says it's been badly let down by the government. The manager here sent this letter to residents asking them to move out by the end of the month, saying it's no longer possible to provide you with the care and support you need because of ongoing staffing issues and operational difficulties due to COVID-19. Thousands have already lost their lives in the care sector. Now others are losing their homes. 91-year-old Mary Masters is among them. She moved out of Friary Lodge yesterday. And how are you feeling after the move? Well, I'm still a bit confused. Her daughter's now settling her in to a new home. She's very sad. You know, she liked that care home. She was very settled there. Your biggest concern is just that you might lose her because that's the point at which uh, a lot of people do pass at the point at which they're sort of shifting care homes. With others due to move in the coming weeks, tonight the government offered no new support. Care homes say there isn't enough funding, it's not getting through to them, so what more will you do to help keep them open? There is support that we are providing uh, and we will continue to do that and what I would recommend to any business is to have a discussion with their banks and see whether they are going to be eligible uh, for the support that we have provided. But without extra help for care homes, it's not just the books but lives in the balance. Paul Brand, News at 10. The way this crisis has played out in care homes has been utterly, utterly brutal. And speaking of that, the grief of a family of a coronavirus victim has been compounded by anger and, frankly, incomprehension at how she might have caught it. Belly Majinga, a care worker, a key worker in the ticket office at London's Victoria Station, was spat at whilst on duty with a colleague in the station concourse by a man who told them he had the virus. Both women fell ill and Miss Majinga died. Her family say her bosses didn't do enough to protect her. Today, the Prime Minister's spokesman uh, called the alleged attack absolutely despicable. Another significant move to get the economy moving in England has been set out tonight. The housing market, shut down since March, is to reopen from tomorrow, with viewings, removals and estate agents uh, all reopening. Carl joins me. Uh, so, Carl, let's just be clear about all this. You, can, uh, you can't visit two parents at the same time, but you can look around a stranger's house. Is that the uh, height of it? That's right, Tom. It sounds pretty odd, doesn't it? But that's what the government is saying tonight. They say that 450,000 people who want to move have had their plans put on hold since March. So they're opening up again the, uh, the uh, property market. And that does mean that you can view houses. Now, in the first instance, they want you to do that virtually. But if you want to take it further and actually go and see a place, you can do it. 
They're encouraging people who go to see someone else's property, wash their hands as soon as they go in. The people selling the place should leave all the internal doors open so that there's the minimal touching of surfaces. And of course, that two meter rule applies the whole time to everyone. Everyone has to try and keep apart if at all possible. But it will also be possible to move house. Uh, again, there are guidelines. Uh, furniture should be cleaned before and after a removal and there will be guidelines for the removal company involving face masks and so on. But it will seem odd to many people that you can't even go and meet more than one parent in the most remote spot in the country, but you can, as you've said, go into a stranger's house for a look around. All right, Carl, thank you very much indeed. Now, if you got up yesterday morning and headed to work, as per the Prime Minister's suggestion, you will probably have picked up by now that he in fact meant tomorrow. The advice remains for people to avoid, if possible, public transport. And if that's not possible, new guidance suggests sitting two metres apart, not face to face, but side by side, wearing a face covering and avoiding Russia. And then there are the guidelines for what happens when you get to work. But will it all be in place by the morning? At Euston train station today, more staff than passengers at times. But what will tomorrow bring? Government has encouraged people to go to work in England if they can't operate from home. This NHS nurse fears transport is not ready. It's become busier. It's become more difficult to social distance. I think they should try and have the separation of the seats by blocking off one seat between people at the very least. Here, safe distancing markers are down, sanitizer ready. But tomorrow's return to work day comes before any significant increase in public transport capacity. Some now fear the overall impact will be to make it harder for essential key workers to travel. Bus services too are bracing for tomorrow's expected rise in users. At least 52 UK transport workers have died in this pandemic. Today unions said government has failed to place proper limits on passenger numbers. The public transport system, buses and tubes and trains, will become a magnet for the virus if we see overcrowding and that's what we've got a real fear about now. The government guidance includes nothing at all about maximum loads. Government guidelines for England issued today warn there's capacity for only one in ten passengers on parts of the transport network due to COVID-19 measures and that social distancing is not possible at times on journeys. Separate guidelines for reopening workplaces say employers must conduct COVID-19 risk assessments with workers and consider barriers in shared spaces where distancing is impossible. It is now time to consider how together we emerge from this crisis. On Sunday, the Prime Minister set out the first careful steps for reopening society and a roadmap for the weeks and the months ahead. Undoubtedly, transport is going to play a very central role in that recovery. But increased precautions in the workplace can prove complex. This Leicestershire garden centre is delaying its reopening, estimating the work will take weeks. We can look at social distancing in the store, perspex screens at the tills, um, obviously PPE for all the staff, and everything that we can to sort of protect everybody that's working here and the customers coming in. As government shifts its messaging across England, tomorrow will bring the first effects, and those who return to work start a much longer journey towards life as we once knew it. Chris Choi, News at 10. Well, hopes of having a foreign holiday might be one of the things keeping some people going during the coronavirus crisis. So the Health Secretary's statement that such holidays are unlikely to be possible this summer will have come as a bitter disappointment. This is what Matt, Matt Hancock told ITV's This Morning. Social distancing of some kind is going to continue. And I think, you know, the conclusion from that is that it is unlikely that uh, big, lavish international holidays are going to be possible for uh, for, for this summer. I, I just think that's a, a, a reality of life. And there wasn't much good news from Spain either. They say holidaymakers will have to spend 14 days in quarantine when they arrive, starting from this Friday. 
Now, Northern Ireland won't be following England in easing lockdown restrictions, at least not yet. The leaders of its executive have revealed a plan, but without any dates attached. First Minister Arlene Foster said the rate at which the virus is reproducing is still too high for the executive's five-point plan to be introduced just yet. But she wanted people to have an indication of how things would go when the time came. The next review is due at the end of the month. On the subject of lifting lockdowns, the French are ahead of all parts of the UK. They've been reducing restrictions again this week. Some primary school children have now gone back. The UK epidemic has pretty much mirrored France's, but with well over 32,000 deaths, we are now some way ahead of their figure of almost 20. 7,000. Back at the start of the epidemic, it was pretty touch and go as to whether French hospitals would be overwhelmed. They weren't. After eight long weeks of hibernation, spring is emerging on the streets of Paris, a nation released from a lockdown much stricter than anything seen in the UK. Outdoors and shopping again without the need to carry a signed document of authorization, Joggers and cyclists taking their first outdoor exercise in months along the banks of the Seine. France too got off to a bad start in this pandemic, but has caught up rapidly. At this hospital in the Paris suburb of Neuilly, an intensive care unit almost overwhelmed in early April, still has many COVID-19 patients, but is now well within capacity. A health system envied by many in Europe thought it would be able to cope easily. In the end, it was a close-run thing. We were very close to the failure, but we did not reach that point. We had enough uh, ventilator, but it was very, very, <laughs> very creepy. As in Britain, the French system started with nothing like enough protective equipment. But if the experience of these wards is anything to go by, they did always have enough and have managed to keep infection rates among staff here mercifully low. Yes, we had all the protective equipment we needed, but it was every day from a, non, a, a different way. So sometimes the, the, the wearing were black, sometimes they were blue, sometimes they were arranged. I don't know where they find them, but we had enough. The effectiveness of the lockdown in France has taken the pressure off their health service. New infections per day are now in the hundreds rather than the thousands still being seen in Britain. And yet there's still great dissatisfaction with how the government have responded. When the French saw pictures like these from intensive care units in Italy, they thought it would never happen to them. We think in France that uh, we are a model for the social state, and this social state was uh, not able uh, to save life as we hoped. But for all that dissatisfaction, their success in getting the infection rate down has meant a very significant relaxation this week not least beginning to get French school children back into the classroom. Just the youngest for now and staying well apart with strict limits of 15 per classroom. So not every child can go in every day, but when schools are back, the parents can be back at work. An important step closer to normality. James Mace, News at 10, Paris. To Wuhan in China now, where you will recall the virus originated and where a very small new outbreak has prompted a very large response. The city's entire population of 11 million people, yes, all 11 million people, is to be tested after just six people living in one residential block were reported to have the virus. It is the first cluster of cases since the city started reopening more than a month ago. OK, it now looks like one of the toughest lockdowns in the world will last for at least 11 weeks. Restrictions in the capital of the Philippines, Manila, are being extended until the end of the month. The country has had just over 700 deaths. The president, Rodrigo Duterte, has already said those who don't obey the rules will be shot. And as we'll see, they are. This is what lockdown looks like in the slums of Metro Manila. Too cramped is the housing and too poor are the people for street life to stop. But every community is being guarded by the police or soldiers who are enforcing one of the strictest and deadliest quarantine policies in the world. I will not hesitate to order the police to arrest and detain you. 
The country's radical president, Rodrigo Duterte, has given officers the right to shoot anyone breaching the rules. Shoot them dead. The army needed no encouragement. This was soldiers surrounding and killing a man they claimed had a gun at a quarantine checkpoint. More than 30,000 people have so far been arrested for violating the lockdown. These volunteers were even targeted when distributing food parcels. Ayun, na banggit ko naman na, na nung nakaraan, di, hindi pa rin ako makarecover dun sa ano eh, ah, hindi ko matanggap na krimen pala yung ganong pagtulong. With the president threatening to impose martial law to crack down on dissent, it has created a heightened climate of fear among those struggling to cope with the restrictions. Michelle Castillo is relying on aid to feed her young children and is terrified of catching the virus. Ibali na kahit paano walang kainin, basta importante, hindi mo makuha yung sakit na ganun. Kasi yun, mas delikado kasi ano na ang buhay mo doon, mamamatay ka. E sa gutom kahit paano, makaka-recover ka pa. The Philippines General Hospital was the first to receive coronavirus cases. Its COVID ward is still full, but no longer overwhelmed. A high death rate due to initial equipment and staff shortages has been hard to deal with. Nurse Tai now starts each shift with a prayer. Every start of the duty, I pray. Nag-pray kami ni Tito na sana hindi sila magtagal. Kasi yung mga patients dyan na paulit-ulit yung swab positive pa rin. So lahat naman, kahit na, natatakot kami sa loob, hopeful pa rin kami for the patients na they get well, they go home safely. In this densely populated and developing nation, they are vulnerable to the virus and facing an extreme and at times lethal lockdown. Debbie Edward, News at 10. Just when you thought you'd seen everything. Well, let's come back here and have some sport rarely now. And not surprisingly, perhaps working out the right conditions for a return to action of Premier League footballers is proving very difficult. We've now seen plans for testing players, not just for the virus, but also checks for any underlying heart or lung problems. Those plans have been sent to players to consider before they can even resume proper training, let alone actually play in a match. South Korea's footballers are already there. Premier League stars are due to step into this unfamiliar world of daily checks on Monday. Under draft proposals which they'll be asked to sign up to, players will be tested for COVID-19 twice a week as they take the first small steps towards finishing the season. Once that side of the, the people's safety and, and the player's safety is secured and, and their well-being is, is being looked after, I think, you know, that's the right time to, to go back in. But until then, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, up, uh, how can I say, I'm kind of not scared, but yeah, kind of, you know, reserved and, and thinking what, what the worst outcome could be. So far, they've been exercising alone. Now they'll arrive changed, keep two metres apart, be encouraged to wear a mask, told not to spit, and if they need treatment, the club medic will wear full PPE, an environment that could give a player second thoughts. I would feel uh, total empathy with him. I would feel that, that that is entirely his decision as well too, and that is something that if he did not want to play because uh, he didn't feel that he or his family uh, w could, uh, that, that they could have a problem with all of this here, I would absolutely and utterly agree with him. During the Bundesliga's training phase, after 10 positive tests, two entire squads were put into isolation. But still, their season restarts on Saturday. As players here assess what they're being asked to do, they'll have one eye on Germany. Any mishap there will undermine the Premier League's conviction that finishing the season now is the right course of action. Steve Scott, News at 10. Well, in the depths of the coronavirus pandemic, International Nurses' Day was always going to have more than its usual importance. And to make the day that little bit extra special, the royal family linked up online with modern-day Nightingales, right, Nightingales right across the Commonwealth, including this call from the Queen. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. Good afternoon. This is rather an important day. Oh, it is. It's quite special, the International Nurses' Day being recognised by the general public. Yes, because they obviously had a very important part to play recently. 
And to round off the celebrations, Parliament is lit up tonight with an image of the woman who started it all. Today is the 200th anniversary, of course, of the birth of Florence Nightingale, founder of Modern Nursing. There she is, in part dressed as a modern nurse. And we end tonight with the stories of the care given by her successors to two of their own. Celebrations for an NHS nurse whose life was saved from a virus that has claimed so many others. Millie Magajela almost didn't make it. This moment all the more poignant because she survived. When I went out, I saw all these people, they were clapping and showing support and love to me. What came into my head and I said, oh, all these people, they have really saved my life. Do you know, I have... I had no words to explain how I felt about the whole thing. And um, I just felt so loved. A nurse of 39 years who became a patient at the hospital where she worked, being cared for by her colleagues. They are my heroes. They are risking their lives. It's because they are so devoted, determined and um, compassionate. I'm here today only because of them and they have given me a second chance to live. What do you feel that you would Lisa Cox to feels the same. Afterwards. Her life was also saved by the critical care nurses and doctors with whom she worked, spending five days as a COVID patient in her own intensive care unit. I owe them everything. I owe them my life and I think it's thanks to them that my children still have a mum. She is now back on the ward helping her colleagues. I had such fantastic care by the team that I work with and I want to be with them. I'm part of that team. Lisa says she wants to be there for patients just as her own colleagues were there for her. Sejal Karia, News at 10. Something to lift our spirits. That's it. Good night. See you tomorrow.